Welcome back to Pharmacology. This lecture is going to cover NSAIDs, migraine medications, opioid agonists, opioids, and then opioid antagonists, naloxone, which is Narcan. In the pharmacology book, we're looking at chapters 14, 15, and 16, and there are PowerPoints, of course, to go along with the lecture. So we're going to start with chapter 14, which is NSAIDs and migraine medications. Um, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Just like the name implies, they're not steroids, but they are medications that are used specifically to decrease inflammation. Um, very common use would be things like osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, where there's joint inflammation and pain because of it, so these are medications that work very effectively at decreasing the inflammation, decreasing pain. And then one end said particularly ibuprofen, which is very effective at reducing fever as well. So the must-know meds, you must know ibuprofen, also known as Motrin or Advil, naproxen, naproxen sodium, which is also known as Aleve over-the-counter. And then the other two are meloxicam, also known as Mobic and celecoxib, which is also known as Celebrex. So what are the things that you need to know about these medications? Well, that's what I'm gonna tell you. We don't know the mechanism of action, and you know, frankly, it really doesn't matter. Decreases inflammation, decreases pain, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and reduce fever. Um, when we look at side effects or adverse reactions, there are some commonalities that are shared with NSAIDs. So uh, if you look at four, uh, slide four, GI system reactions that are generalized, well, you know, nausea, vomiting, and stomach upset, which is dyspepsia, of course, diarrhea, constipation. But the big ones that you need to remember are the highlighted ones. Intestinal ulceration, even up to and including GI bleeding. So, and that holds true for all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, just as it holds true for aspirin, even though aspirin is a salicylate and not an NSAID. Um, other reactions, I'm going to get a little more specific uh, with celecoxib particularly. Celecoxib has the potential adverse reaction for deep vein thrombosis, in other words, you know, making a blood clot occur, which can then lead to a CDA or stroke. Uh, it can cause cardiac arrhythmias, even up to and including a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. So if you have a patient that's got any kind of a history that's cardiac at all, celecoxib is not the drug for them, all right? That's something that you need to remember. Uh, when it comes to other adverse reactions, potentially, you know, definitely take a look at the other slides here, hematuria, which is blood in the urine, cystitis, elevated blood urea, nitrogen, this urea, all those things can occur with impaired renal function. So if you have a patient whose renal function, kidney function is not up to par, maybe you want to rethink or cautiously use this group of medications unless the risk is less than what the benefit would be. Skin reactions. This is something that is important. Oh, my bad. Don't forget about hematologic reactions. These drugs can actually cause neutropenia, eosinophilia, leukopenia, pancytopenia, thrombocytopenia, all of those words under hemato hematological reactions are about diminished blood cells, whether we're talking about white blood cells, which would be neutropenia and leukopenia, we're talking about red blood cells, eosinophilia, um, aplastic anemia, we're talking about thrombocytes, which platelets, thrombocytopenia, a granulocytosis, granulocytes are a particular type of white blood cell, and then pancytopenia. When you see pan at the beginning of a word, that kind of means todos, all, right? So in other words, diminished blood cells in general, white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets, okay? Uh, when we get to skin reactions, there are a couple skin reactions that are important for you to know about. Uh, of course, a rash, because a patient could certainly be allergic to any medication, erythema, redness. But when they are severe, there is uh, something called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Uh, and, and under that umbrella, also toxic epidermal necrolysis. How's that for a mouthful? 
Uh, they're both kind of similar, uh, except Steven Johnson syndrome is a milder variation where toxic epidermal necrolysis is more severe and significant. And when you look at that, that word toxic, meaning could be deadly, epidermal pertaining to the epidermis outer layer of the skin, necrolysis, necrotizing, in other words, destruction of the cells of the skin tissue. So I've put a nice explanation in here, and this came right from the Merck manual, which should be your Bible when it comes to pathophys and diagnoses. Stephen Johnson syndrome, it's a rare but serious disorder of skin and mucous membranes. It's a medical emergency, can be fatal. And it starts out with flu-like symptoms. So patient will start out having maybe fever, rash, uh, and blisters, not just on the skin, but on mucous membranes. In other words, in the mouth, the nose, right? Um, the only thing that we can do is control the symptoms. So we're going to be treating the symptoms. And of course, common sense, stop the drug. Obviously, the drug is not appropriate for that person. With toxic epidermal necrolysis, even more severe reaction. And these, both of these syndromes are associated with sulfa drugs, anti-epileptics or anti-convulsant drugs, and antibiotics, uh, in addition to some of these NSAIDs. Um, they start out as macules. Macules are a form of a lesion on the skin that kind of look like a blister and they can coalesce. In other words, they, there's so many of them that they all kind of like look like one big blister and the blisters will start to ooze. They will start to, they'll, you'll see death of this tissue around the blisters and the skin will literally start to sloth off. All right. Uh, the only way to diagnose this is, is usually by clinical observation. So in other words, we're looking at the patient and saying, well, this really looks like either Stevens Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis. And again, treatment is purely supportive to make sure you understand Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. The only treatment is to treat the symptoms and that's it. Um, as we go on through the slides, if you look at slide number 10, it talks about metabolic or endocrine reactions and, you know, some other kind of vague reactions, thirst, fever, chills, and even vaginitis, which isn't fun, and inflammation of the vagina. Uh, slide 11, the thing that you really want to remember with NSAIDs in general is the risk for peptic ulcers or GI bleed. That's the big one. And that holds true for all the NSAIDs. And then with celecoxib, we talked about the cardiac disease, history of cardiac disease, history of stroke, and an allergy to sulfa or sulfonamides. Celecoxib is one of those other medications that has a sulfa base. And so if the person's allergic to sulfa, not a drug to give them. Make sure you remember that. You're going to see questions in ATI about that. And then by the same mechanism that they can cause bleeding, GI bleeding and, and ulcerations, remember when it comes to drug-drug interactions, if a person is on any type of an antiplatelet aggregator or anticoagulant, NSAIDs are not the drug for them because they will increase the bleeding risk, okay? And that's very important for you to remember. Um, the next category, drugs used in the treatment of migraine headaches. So migraine headaches are kind of uh, a strange thing. We, we really don't completely understand why some people get them and some people don't. But anybody that's ever had a migraine can tell you that the pain, it's a headache unlike any that anyone's ever had before, to the point where even light is painful. So you'll see patients that will have to lie quietly and still in a completely darkened room. By the way, that sensitivity to light where the light is painful, that's photo. Phobia. And so we have a drug, and the drug that you need to know, slide 16, Sumatriptan, which uh, the brand name is Imitrex. That is probably one of the most popular migraine medications that's on the market, and that's the one you need to know for ATI and for the boards. So one of the things that we believe when it comes to migraine headaches is that there's some kind of a vasal, you know, a vasal, vasal spastic action happening in the brain. So in other words, 
there are spasms of blood vessels that are happening. And so what happens with this classification of drugs, sumatriptan, will actually activate these certain receptors that will vasoconstrict, stop those spasms, and then provide relief from the pain of the headache. Keep in mind that with almost every medication, the very thing that a medication can treat most of the time, not every single time, but most of the time, the very thing a medication can treat a medication can cause is an adverse effect. Isn't that fun? And especially when we're talking about drugs that treat blood pressure, drugs that treat neurological disorders like anti-epileptic drugs, et cetera, et cetera. And that would include this particular kind of drug, sumatriptan, because the number one adverse effect potentially is a vasospastic response. So in other words, what can happen, and look at slide 18 for this one, the Vasospasms that occur, we believe in the brain that this is supposed to control, it can actually cause vasospasms in other blood vessels, including the heart. And vasospastic response would be chest pain. Patient will take the med and then suddenly feel either palpitations or a fluttering in the chest or intermittent chest pain. This is a serious adverse effect that can potentially cause a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. So that is a situation where patients stop the drug, call the healthcare provider right away. So remember that sumatriptan, one of the major side effects or adverse effects is this vasospastic response. Uh, so that being said, you wouldn't want to use that drug in a patient with some kind of ischemic heart disease. In other words, they've got angina or they've already had an MI, a heart attack. If they've had a mini stroke, a TIA, or an actual stroke, their blood pressure is uncontrolled, or if they're taking a classification of antidepressants called MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So you want to make sure that you know those things. It's a large drug drug. Um, and again, talked about this before. With NSAIDs, GI bleed, GI bleed, GI bleed. Anybody that's got a history of a GI bleed absolutely wouldn't be a candidate because these drugs can cause a GI bleed. Anybody with cardiovascular disease, stroke, hypertension, peptic ulcers, impaired hepatic or renal function. Because remember, the two organs that are responsible for the excretion of all drugs, it's your liver and your kidneys, your kidneys and your liver. So these are all things that need to be assessed by you, the nurse, before the administration of these medications, because you're the last line of defense between your patient and the grave. Uh, please go through and read the nursing process as far as assessment. So in other words, when you're assessing your patient, you know, what, what are we looking at? What is their pain, right? So, you know, are, the, are their joints swollen as in, you know, rheumatoid arthritis? Um, are they able to carry out their activities of daily living? Um, go through and, and read the nursing assessments. Nursing diagnoses uh, are on page 23. And then the expected outcome on 24, you know, what, what do you want to happen? What's the therapeutic effect? Well, you hope that the drug works either by reducing pain, reducing inflammation, or reducing fever, and that you've either managed or they haven't had any adverse reactions. Makes sense. And NSAIDs should be given with either food or milk. Help with that gastrointestinal distress. Remember, I always talk about this, the very old, the very young, the very old, the very young, they are the most vulnerable population. And elderly folks are definitely more vulnerable to having a GI bleed. Um, so make sure that you know that. Uh, we're going to talk real quickly about nursing assessment of pain. I want to make sure that everybody understands nursing assessment of pain and then nursing process evaluation. So if you look at slide 34, Evaluation, relief from pain and discomfort, better mobility. So in other words, when you're documenting, what, what, what should you be documenting? If you assess your patient and their pain is 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 on the scale, you administer pain medication, you go back and you reassess them, say, in about a half an hour or so, 40 minutes, because with oral medications, it takes about that long for them to do their thing. Well, how do we know if it worked? You don't need to write medication was effective or good result. I don't know what that means. 
here's what you do. When you go back in to reassess, you ask Mrs. Jones, how's your pain now? You know, quantify your pain, zero to 10, where are you? And Mrs. Jones tells you that she's at a four now. That's all you have to write. Because if at 0700, her pain was nine out of 10, and then you, the nurse, administered 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, and then you go back 30 minutes later, you can just document 0730, patient states pain zero four slash 10 on scale. And we all understand when we read that, that it worked, right? You don't need to write anything more than that. Um, when we talk about pain management, the key to pain management is the assessment of pain. So if you don't do a thorough assessment, that's where the problems lie. And pain is subjective. I've talked about this before. You can look at a patient and they can tell you that their pain is a 10, but they might have a smile on their face. Or you can look at a patient who's telling you their pain is a three and they're screaming. So it's very subjective. And pain tolerance, in other words, how much pain can someone bear before their perception of it is unbearable, is very different from patient to patient. So you have to keep those things in mind. When you are assessing pain, there are a couple things also that you need to know. And definitely look at um, slide 36, 37. With older people, sometimes they tend to be stoic. They, they practice stoicism. And what that means is, suck it up, buttercup right? That, that's, that's a blunt definition of stoicism. If something is painful to them, it almost makes them feel that they look weak if they admit it. So oftentimes if you'll say, hey, Mrs. Jones, are you having any pain? She'll say, no, you can't leave it there because, you know, older people are going to have some degree of discomfort somewhere. Very, very rare, not impossible, but rare that somebody say over the age of 50, 55, 60 has no discomfort. So you want to ask more specific questions. Do you feel stiff or achy when you get up in the morning? Do you have any discomfort when you do activities of daily living? So for example, if you're doing yard work or you're vacuuming, sometimes you kind of have to pull the information out of people. Just asking a very blunt question like, do you have pain? That's, that's closed-ended. They can say yes, they can say no. So you want to make sure that you're getting the specifics for that patient. And then if they do admit to having pain, you got a bunch of questions you have to ask. You got to find out about the pain. Does it keep you awake at night? Does it prevent you from falling asleep? Does it wake you up in the middle of the night? And then what are exacerbating or relieving factors? In other words, exacerbating what things make your pain worse? Relieving factors are what things make your pain better. Describe your pain. This is where you're doing something called qualifying the pain. And you'll see on 37, I go into more detail. Qualifying pain means describe it. What's it feel like? Is it burning, throbbing, aching, stabbing? Right? You need to know that information. You want to ask them things like, does pain affect your mood? Have you been feeling depressed or sad lately more than usual? Have you been feeling irritable or short-tempered? Have you been feeling anxious? What are you using? If Are you using anything? Are you using over-the-counters? Are you using herbals? Do you see an acupuncturist or acupressurist or a chiropractor? You need to get all the information. And then what is the pain doing to affect your life? In other words, can you shower and wash your hair? Do you have range of motion to do the things you need to do? Can you brush your teeth? Are you able to cook a meal, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, page, page or slide 37 gets into the patient's subjective qualification of the pain. In other words, what's it feel like? The location of the pain, where does it hurt? And then that's important too because sometimes pain is radiating or referred. So what do we mean by that? So pain that radiates is if I have, say, lower back pain, lumbar spine pain, but I tell you I feel like the pain is running down the back of my leg, that's radiating, right? Radiating pain. Usually it's related to nerve injury. Doesn't always have to be, but typically that is what it is. And then referred pain. Referred pain, I'm going to use the heart attack as the example. Referred pain means it hurts somewhere 
other than where the injury or insult is. For patients that have MIs, especially women, this is important to remember, symptoms of a heart attack are not kind of like what you see on TV. The guy clutches his chest, oh, my chest hurts, and he keels over. No, it doesn't work like that, especially for women. So sometimes women can have neck pain, lumbar, lower back pain. Sometimes women can have indigestion with belching that persists over days and days and days. All of these things are considered referred pain because their chest doesn't hurt. It doesn't, their heart doesn't hurt. They're not having angina. They're having pain in other places. Left arm, yes, if they're having pain in the left arm, but they could be having pain in the right arm. It's an old wives' tale that it has to be on the left side. It could be either side. So pain that's referred is pain other than where the injury or insult is. Make sure you understand that. And then we talk about how do we quantify, in other words, put a number on the pain. Well, if you're dealing with a patient that's awake, alert, and oriented, that's pretty easy. Zero is no pain. Ten is the worst pain you've ever had. Put a number on your pain. How bad is it? But what if you're dealing with an old person who maybe has a little dementia? Or what if you're dealing with someone who's nonverbal? Or what if you're dealing with a toddler? What if you're dealing with a newborn or an infant? So we have other scales that can be used. So the numeric scale is the 0 to 10 scale. Then we have the Wong Baker Faces scale. And I'm sure you've all seen that. It is a series of faces that the first face is like, you know, happy face, like everything's good. And progressively, the faces get more and more more until the very last face. Oh. So a child, you'd be able to show them those faces and go, which one do you feel like? Or even somebody that's cognitively impaired as far as possibly mental retardation, you might be able to use that scale. Then we have the flak scale. And the flak scale is basically used for infants, newborns and infants, because what you're doing is you're basically observing the baby to see, are they crying? How badly are they crying? Are they inconsolable? And I will insert the flak scale in here and the Wong Baker faces scale so you can see those again uh, and then you know what they are. Make sure you know what they are. All right. Um, Understand what the term precipitating event or precipitating factor means. It's not precipitation like, oh, it's raining outside. A precipitating event or precipitating factor is something that happened to trigger that, in this case, we're talking about pain. In other words, oh, my lower back hurts. Did anything happen before the pain started? Uh huh, I fell and landed on my back. I fell off a ladder. Well, the fall from the ladder was the precipitating event, all right, that triggered the pain. So that, you know, make sure you understand what a precipitating event is. And then, as always, if you have somebody who's completely nonverbal, you know, there are things that you as the nurse can do. Number one, observe the patient. When you touch the patient, certain areas, are they making faces grimacing, or maybe uh, making a moan. If you're moving a patient that's non-responsive to do, say, AM care or, you know, perineal care, again, are they moaning? Are they making, you know, these grimacing faces? You need to be alert and looking at your patient to see if they are having pain because you wouldn't want to be in pain and have no one notice, right? So that's important to remember. So nursing observation. And then one more thing I'm going to throw in for anybody that's familiar with Woodbine Developmental Center. So Woodbine has a patient population that is predominantly not just physically but cognitively impaired and at different levels of cognitive impairment. And so they, you're working in an emergency room and an aide from Woodbine comes, accompanies one of the patients into the ER and they're, you know, the, the aide is telling you that the patient has been having pain. So you need to ask the aide, or if it's a family member that's brought that patient in, if the patient is unable to answer or participate in the interview, is this what this person usually looks like? Is this how they usually respond? So, because they're the ones that are with that patient all the time. 
So they're going to be able to tell you if something is off or something is different or the patient's behaving in a way that would make you suspect they're having some type of pain. So always ask the caregiver, you know, when in doubt, because that's going to give you some good information. And then there is a question that you can ask. And I learned this a long time ago, working in emergency medicine that can save you so much time. And that question is, has this ever happened before? Because if the answer to that question is yes, you just saved yourself a bunch of time. So yes, oh, it did happen before? Tell me about it. Did you go to the doctor or seek medical attention? Were you diagnosed? Were you treated? So now you can, you know, kind of go right to the chase. But if they say, no, this is new, this has never happened before, then you got to go back to all those questions like a detective trying to solve a case to find out what happened, what could be going on. Okay. And, um, you know, make sure you look at these other slides. Slide 39 talks about people that are the high risk for poor pain assessment, infants, children, older adults that are cognitively impaired, developmentally disabled adults and children. Think about people with communication problems. So where English is not the primary language, you get an interpreter. If possible, you get an interpreter that is the same sex as the patient. And every hospital, every facility is now mandated by Medicare. They must have some type of interpreting service. Please, for the love of God, don't grab the janitor down the hall and go, uh, do you speak Mandarin? Yeah? Come on in. Can you help me? And don't use a family member if it can be avoided. So in other words, you need to get a professional interpreter. Because sometimes a family member is not going to be able to communicate the information from the patient to you and vice versa from you to the patient in a complete and unedited way, if that makes sense. So make sure that it is an objective, non-involved, professional interpreter. And most facilities now have phone lines that you can call and they've got like hundreds and hundreds of interpreters that speak hundreds of languages. So, uh, and if you are using an interpreter in person, here's another helpful hint with ATI. When you're speaking, you speak and look at your patient. You don't look at the interpreter because your patient is going to get what they need verbally from the interpreter over there. But they need to see you, your body language, as you're explaining or asking questions. It's important for you to be looking at your patient. Okay? All right. So that is chapter um, 14 NSAIDs and migraine meds. And now we're going to move on to chapter 15. Okay, so stand by. Okay, so now we're going to move on to chapters 15 and 16, and they go together. Chapter 15 is opioid agonists. Remember, back from Farm 1, um, an agonist is something that, a drug that creates a response, right? We give you a drug that is going to act in some way to make something happen, right? Some type of a therapeutic effect. So opioid agonists are all your opioids. And uh, I list them on this uh, second slide. Morphine, morphine sulfate. Morphine sulfate is kind of the prototype, right, of all the uh, opioids. Uh, it's fast acting. Remember, when things act quickly, they're usually fast in, fast out. So it needs to be given on a regular basis and with, with really severe pain, it should be given regularly around the clock, scheduled, because it's fast in, but it also wears off fast. Then you've got codeine. Um, it is used sometimes as an antitussive, so you will see codeine in some cough syrups, but it is also an opioid, okay? Meperidine, also known as Demerol, opioid. Hydromorphone, Dilaudid. Hydrocodone hydrocodone slash APAP. So when you see that written, that's a Percocet, by the way, you will see hydrocodone slash APAP, and then you will see something like 5 slash 325. What that means is it's a combination drug. Percocet has hydromorphone, which is the opioid, and that would be the 5, 5 milligrams of hydromorphone, and then it's got acetaminophen. That's the APAP. Okay, so if you see 5 slash 325, that indicates 5 milligrams of hydromorphone, 325 milligrams of acetaminophen. 
And then we've got oxycodone, oxycontin. Oxycodone is a derivative of morphine, and it's a quicker acting. And then oxycontin is sustained release. So that's one of those that we can give every 12 hours or so, and it's a slow and steady. And then we have tramadol, also known as Ultram. Tramadol is a type of opioid. Yes, it, it did not used to be included under opioids, narcotics, but we understand now that the mechanism of action is an opioid mechanism of action. It blocks those opioid receptors and, you know, has all the same types of side effects too that the opioids have that we're going to talk about. So, you know, tramadol. And then slide three talks about last but not least, of course, fentanyl. And fentanyl can be used or given in a transdermal patch, which is a slow acting sustained release. Fentanyl can also be given IV. Fentanyl should never be sucked out of a transdermal patch. Uh, let me explain. Uh, for people that have addiction problems, and we all know about the opioid crisis that's happening right now, uh, what we're finding is some people are overdosing for a couple different reasons. One reason is that we're finding fentanyl actually mixed into these bundles of heroin. So people are buying things and they don't really know what they're buying. I mean, it's not like going to Macy's and buying a dress. You can't bring it back. Hey, there's fentanyl in my heroin. I don't like it. I want a refund. It doesn't work that way. Fentanyl is a very powerful opioid. Uh, so that's one of the issues with overdose. And something called dumpster diving. So if you've never heard of it, congratulations. You are living a good life. But for those that don't know what it is, let me explain. Dumpster diving is you will find people with very severe addiction problems sometimes going through dumpsters at nursing homes and different nursing facilities. What are they looking for? Not food. What they're hoping to find is used fentanyl patches, transdermal patches. And what they do is they'll actually pull them from the garbage, open them, take a knife or some sharp object and slice the patch open and suck the fentanyl out of the patch. I know, seems horrific, but it's a thing. So I need to let you know about it. That's why it's important when we address the way we dispose of these transdermal patches. So with the transdermal patch, what do you need to know? Let me tell you, they are slow acting. So make sure that if you're starting somebody on a fentanyl patch, you have a PRN, something oral or something else to back it up because you're going to put the patch on and it's not going to work immediately. It's going to take some time to work. Um, you want to place these patches and this holds true for other patches as well uh, on an area of the skin with the least amount of hair, but do not shave the patient's body hair. That's actually an increased risk for infection. We used to do that. Advanced evidence shows us that we don't do that anymore. So never shave. And you want to find a fatty area because transdermal patches, the medication slowly seeps from the patch through the dermis, which is the bottom layer of the skin, into fatty tissue, subcutaneous tissue. That's how it's absorbed. So a fatty area is actually best for the application of these patches. Typically, they're changed every three days, every 72 hours. When you apply one, you must always put your initials and the date and the time, right, of when you put it on so that we know when to take it off. Always wear gloves when you're handling these patches. Why? Well, I mean, you don't want to be using fentanyl while you're at work, do you? You could get fired for that. So you're always going to wear gloves. Uh, when you remove these patches, same thing, always wear gloves. And it's important to remember. When the patch is removed, I'm going to make believe this little sticky note is a patch. When the patch is removed, you are to fold the patch into itself so that the actual patch itself where the medication is is on the inside and then dispose of that appropriately. Make sure you remember that, okay? When it comes to all opioids, uh, what do they do? Well, they treat pain in the brain. I'm a poet. They treat pain in the brain. So they're not going to the site of the pain. They're going to receptors in the brain that block the sensation of pain for the patient. So that's how they work. But remember, they carry with them a lot of side effects. And what are opioids used for? If you look at slide six, of course, they treat pain. But they're also used in anesthesia for surgical procedures. 
Um, sometimes obstetrical analgesia, in other words, pain relief for, you know, uh, obstetrical patients, there, you know, is a link between the pain medication that is opioid crossing through the placenta. So they're used very sparingly and under specific circumstances. Uh, they can be administered intrathecally or epidurally. Intrathecally means uh, there is something called an intrathecal pump, which is really groovy. It is a pump that is actually surgically implanted in the peritoneal cavity that releases medication just on a regular basis. So that's intrathecal. And then epidurally, an epidural is when you have a physician that puts a needle directly into the spinal column, into the canal, and the medication is released that way. Uh, there are also some other uses. Uh, there's a drug called Lamotil that's got opioids in it for severe diarrhea and intestinal cramping. And I already talked about codeine and its uses as an anti tussive or a cough medication. But again, you got to be careful when you're using opioids because of these adverse reactions. There are three that you need to recite over and over and over again. Make sure you know these. So respiratory depression, urinary retention, paralytic ileus, because there are three adverse reactions that can kill you, right? Yes, opioids will constipate you, but nobody ever died from constipation. You can die from respiratory depression or urinary retention or a paralytic ileus. So they're the three that you need to know. So central nervous system, when we talk about adverse reactions, sedation, Anybody that's ever had a pain med knows you feel a little loopy, right? So you'll feel sedated. They can also cause increased intracranial pressure. So you would not administer these drugs, or at least you would use them cautiously with somebody who is at risk for increased intracranial pressure. From a respiratory perspective, depressed breathing rate, a normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Anything less than 12, you are concerned. It needs to be reported because what can happen is respiratory arrest. And by the way, when people overdo overdose from opioids, they don't have a heart attack. They, they go into respiratory arrest, not cardiac arrest. What happens is their breathing rate slows down to the point where they actually stop breathing at all. So that's adverse effect. Paralytic ileus. So there's a portion of the small intestine. It is the distal portion of the small intestine that connects to the large intestine, and it's called the ileum. And this happens very frequently post-abdominal surgery. That's why we listen to bowel sounds, bowel sounds. They got to have bowel sounds in every quad. <laughs> it's important because the bowel sounds tell us that there's peristalsis. In other words, these wave-like contractions of the intestines are still happening postoperatively. And that indicates that even though they have had nothing to eat or drink because they were just in surgery, there's still air that's moving through the intestines. And that's that rumbling. You know, people will say, well, my stomach is growling, I'm hungry. And your stomach's not growling. What you're hearing is the sound of air and peristalsis as the air's moving through the intestines. Bowel sounds. So an adverse effect of opioids is that that distal portion of the small intestine, the ileum, can just eh, freeze like a car engine without oil, seizes up, doesn't move, and it can actually rupture, and that is fatal. All right? And then last but not least, urinary retention. All opioids have the potential to cause urinary retention. You don't see that maybe as being such a, 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 a mortal danger, but it is because a couple reasons. If the bladder starts to hold so much urine that the urine is now backing up through the ureters and back into the kidneys, the kidneys can actually rupture. So you can have permanent damage there. And if it's something that's not caught by the healthcare providing staff, the patient can become septic and die. It's important for you to know. And when it comes to constipation, yes, opioids make you constipated. But what do you do about that? If your patient's going to be prescribed an opioid, you're going to tell them in advance, listen, this is a drug that is constipating and has the potential for constipation. So you want to make sure they're increasing their fluid intake. 
And the fluid intake is important for a couple reasons. One, to prevent constipation. Two, to help their body excrete the drug so that they're not having a cumulative effect or a buildup of the drug in their body. So increase fluid and add fiber to your diet so that you can go poopy, right? So those are important things to know. Uh, contraindications for opioids, some of the really important ones. If your patient's got a serious head injury, they're at risk for or they have increased intracranial pressure. Gotta be careful with those opioids. And anybody that's got respiratory issues like acute bronchial asthma, emphysema, or any type of upper airway obstruction, very, very cautious or not at all opioids, right? You got to be careful because you can actually stop their breathing. And remember, don't kill your patient. That's the doctor's job, okay? Uh, other things that you need to know, you know, very old, very young, elderly patients, of course, are always at risk for, you know, sedation, falls. Anybody that's considered what we call opioid naive, and all that means is this is a patient that's really never had opioids before, so it's not going to take much to get them where they need to be as far as pain management and then sedation as well. So we're very cautious with dosages there. Uh, if a patient has benign prostatic hypertrophy, I'm on slide nine, you also would want to be careful or maybe not even administer opioids because of the urinary retention. BPH or an enlarged prostate gland, which the prostate lies anatomically underneath the bladder and the man's urethra actually runs over the prostate. So when the prostate swells, it squeezes the urethra and makes it difficult for the male patient to urinate, which leads to urinary retention. So you don't want to give them something that's going to cause urinary retention because they already have that problem. Makes sense? Uh, when we talk about drug-drug interactions, alcohol, don't take Percocets and then drink some vodka. That's a no-no because of the over-sedation. Antihistamines, things like diphenhydramine, Benadryl, they're sedating. You don't want to use those concomitantly with opioids. Anything that's a sedative, like a chill pill, a hypnotic, a sleeping pill, phenothiazines, which are also used for a depression, uh, you don't want to use those with opioids. Why? Well, central nervous system depression. Antidepressants, you don't want to use those concomitantly with opioids because of the risk of serotonin syndrome or malignant hypertension. So make sure you know that. And then when it comes to herbals, any herbal that treats depression or, <clears throat> or I'm sorry, claims to treat depression may have sedating effects. And then also herbals that treat anxiety. So the ones that you want to be cognizant of are kava, valerian, and chamomile, because those allegedly treat anxiety or depression, and so they can have a sedating effect. If you couple that with an opioid, it's double indemnity. Remember that whole um, synergistic one plus one equals four? That's what you've got going on if you're administering opioids with any of those medications. Go through and look at the assessment, the nursing diagnoses, et cetera, et cetera. I will talk about PCA pump really quickly, which is on slide 17. Uh, make sure you understand with PCA pumps that the patient's supposed to be pushing the button. PCA pump is patient-controlled analgesia. Uh, it can have morphine in it. could have some other type of, of opioid in it as well. There is a basal dose. In other words, the patient will be getting a slow and steady stream, say if it's morphine, maybe one milligram per hour. And then there is a bolus or PRN dose. So the patient has that little button and we will program it based on the specifics of that patient. So in other words, if we program the PRN or bolus dose to administer, say, a quarter milligram of morphine every 15 minutes, that is a dose appropriate for that patient. So even if they took every PRN dose, they shouldn't die. Okay, it's important to know. Um, and there's lockout. So it prevents them from overdosing themselves because they hit the button and boom, they get their bolus dose or their PRN dose of that quarter milligram. And then now they're a little loopy. They're feeling all right. They push the button again. 
or again and again. They can push that button all day. It's only going to deliver maximum what is programmed, that lockout. So if it's a quarter milligram Q15 minutes, that's all they're going to get. Every other time they push that button, they're not getting anything. All right, so make sure you know that. And then chapter 16, I'm going to roll right into because that's opioid antagonist, and that is our friend Narcan, naloxone. That drug does not have a drug effect on you. The only thing that it does is it blocks opioid receptors in the brain. So in other words, it blocks, completely blocks the effect of opioids. So you've seen it on the news, I'm sure. This is a drug where if someone is overdosing on an opioid, whether it's heroin or Roxy's or whatever, we can administer naloxone and reverse the effect of that opioid. So if they're going into respiratory arrest, we can make that stop with naloxone. Keep in mind a couple of things about naloxone. If a patient is given naloxone, you're always going to call 911. I mean, if you're walking down the street and someone is on the ground and someone's screaming, he overdosed, you know, and the patient gets a dose of naloxone, you must call 911 because it's unclear what he took. Was he on heroin? Was he popping Roxy's? How much did he take? Because the naloxone is kind of short acting. So it's going to block the effect of the opioid, but it may wear off while there's still a lot of opioid in his system, which means that you'll bring him back and then he'll die again. Right? And then the other thing to keep in mind is naloxone is always kept in post-op PACU, which is the post anesthesia care unit in the hospitals and surgery centers. Why? Fun fact. When we give people anesthesia, we put them to sleep, general anesthesia for surgery. Sometimes when we stop the anesthesia, they don't wake up on their own. So we have to have naloxone available in order to wake them up so to reverse or block the effects of the opioids. When we give it, if we give it too quickly, as soon as it takes effect, they are going to be in pain because remember, the opioids that are on board, in other words, that they have in their system, are now blocked by the naloxone, so they're going to be in pain. Okay? So these are all important facts you need to know. But that pretty much covers those two chapters, everything you wanted to know about opioids and naloxone, and then also your NSAIDs and sumatriptan, migraine medication. So ta-ta for now. I know you're having a good time with me in pharmacology. It doesn't have to be hard. It's not easy. But others have done it. You can do it too. Stick with me. I'll get you there. All right. Until the next video. Bye.